So in fact, this is exactly what we see. Which means here, what you see is a nomatidium here. You can have a choice of being spinous on, off, on, on, off, off. So indeed, it seems that the pathway is absolutely conserved. You have the very same gene 300 million, away, 300 million years away from food flight. The very same pathway is being used, except now it's being used with an expansion when instead of one, you have two photoreceptor cells. So everything is fit very well. But you know, we are geneticists, and this is correlation. We know that actually the spine is expressed here. Does it play the same role as in fruit flies? So just to show that indeed it's R7 cell and it shows on, off, on, on, off, off. Because it's marked with a prosper R7 marker. So we say it's correlation now. Can we try to do some functional studies on that? And so it's when actually uh, CRISPR appeared on the market. And so we brought actually Vanessa, which actually is very easy to something to grow in the lab. They just grow on artificial food. They can lay tons and tons of eggs on these sticks, which are part of the sunflower. And so what we do, we inject a guide RNA and Cas9 for a gene. First, we want to test the functional gene. You're going to be a gene that gives a, high color, uh, a green color, the yellow gene. So that is it's a butterfly. It's kind of, we did both in Papilio and in Vanessa. So in Papilio, you have this black color. And this black color is due to the fact there is a gene called yellow that makes this black pigment. So now if you make this, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always the same. In, in fruit, you always call the gene. The, the, the white gene is the gene that makes the red eye color. You name it after the, the phenotype of the cell. So we injected Cas9 and guide RNA for. People know that. I mean, if you don't know, you should because it's going to change your life. So, <laughs> so basically, it's a technique to cut a DNA anywhere you want at will by simply injecting a little bit of RNA that is complementary to where your gene that you want to cut, and you have an enzyme that goes together. It's amazing. So we injected the guide RNA and the enzyme that cut the DNA for the yellow gene, and what you have is that. This is actually the, the egg that we, we injected. You let it develop, and what you can see now, the whole butterfly almost become yellow, which means it lost the expression of the black pigment, but it has two copies of the yellow gene, which is both copy and being knocked out here to be able to give to this phenotype. And you have a few traces of leftover, which is basically only one of the two copies. Being there. So extremely efficient. And it's almost too efficient, because now if you want to do the same thing for the spinous gene, spine is the gene which is involved in stochastic choice. The spine is only one of the 20,000 genes in flies, and every gene in flies, except for yellow, has many other functions, and a mutation of spine is least out very early in development. If you don't have spine you don't have a, a flies, or you don't have a butterfly. So what we want to do is to make a mosaic where only, only the eyes are going to be mutant, the rest of the butterfly will be So we have to switch them to Vanessa, and again, we did both in parallel, and so we try to modulate the amount of Cas9 and, and guide RNA that we inject to be able to lower the frequency of knocking out. And you can see you can get almost anything you want in terms of this pigmentation here, which is gone. And actually, I want just to notice that we inject like, in this butterfly not only the yellow guide RNA, but also the guide RNA to be able to knock out the spinous gene. And spinous, as I was telling you, has many functions, including a function in making the antenna. And you can see that in many cases, the antenna is messed up. Because in this case, this butterfly looks pretty normal in terms of yellow, but it lost spines because the antenna is gone, and many other actually have normal antenna. So now we say we can figure out whether or not we can knock out spines and see what happened as a consequence to the phenotype of our eyes. So in fact, it works beautifully well. What you have here is a picture of a retina of butterflies, which have been injected with a Cas9 RNA for spines. And what you can see is again exactly what you expect. Most of the tissue, tissue is wiped out, you get normal expression of spines. But then you have this big patch of tissue, which is the clonal tissue, which lacks the spinal gene. There is no spinal, there is no spinal expression here. So it works. We do have a knockout of spinal in this region, and now we can look, see what's happened, what the consequence of getting rid of spinal in this tissue. So again, what you have here, in a wild type, you have the two R7 cells, and we went normal into the spinal middle. The spinal is standing in a wild type, of course you use spinal if it's knocked out. And you must remember, in fruit flies, spinal activate protein 4, and it activates the repressor DVE that so repress protein 3, which means DV is expressed in the same pattern as spinous. You can see it expressed here on on, off, off. And in the spinous mutant, the spinous gene is off in all of the R7 cells. So it seems that the very same network function here, except in function with spinous, and now with two spinous decisions in the two R7 cells. And now what happened in consequence to Opsin? It's actually a wild tap butterflies. And it has blue and UV opsin, so it can be blue blue, blue UV or UV UV. 
and you have spallets because everybody becomes UV, which means spallets is required for making the blue oxide. And so basically what happens is that you have blue uh, on, off, on, off, on, on, off, off, or spallets. Okay. So these are very nice. It seems to work very beautifully well. But in fact, you might remember something. That in fact, the butterfly eye is a bit more complicated than the fly because in flies, there's only two color photoreceptors, R7 and R8. They make UV green comparison or UV blue comparison. But the butterfly eye, to remember, is more complicated. There are three types. I only mentioned blue, blue, blue UV or UV UV, but in fact, the presence of blue, blue correlates with the presence of a dark green opsin in those four photoreceptors here. When you have both UV and blue, you get a red opsin here, and when you have UV UV, you get a mixture of low expression of dark green and red pigment in the same cell. So now the question is that, is everything influenced by the loss of spiders? Could you also influence the uh, other photoreceptor, the photoreceptors that normally are involved in motion detection, not in color vision, to be able to influence that by the spiders choice? So is spiders uh, in, in, in butterflies influence also the choice of the rhodopsin, the dark green, and the red opsin here? In fact, this is exactly what happened. It's actually a white type tissue Below will be a mutant tissue, remember it's always a camera, and the white type tissue expresses no, this is a dark green, this one expresses no dark green because it's only red, this one expresses high level of dark green, this one expresses very low level of dark green because it's mixed with red. So what you have, and again, the prediction which we made that if spinous is involved in making blue blue, if you don't have spinous, you should lose this one, you should lose this one, everybody should be basically this one, which means low level of the dark green photoreceptor cell. This is exactly what happened. Again, you have in a white type tissue high level of dark green, you have low level of dark green, and you have no dark green here. And again, in a mutant for spinous, everybody becomes low level of dark green, which means exactly what we predict. In fact, spinous does indeed <coughs> control not only the fate of the R7 cell, it also controls the fate of all the cells in the chromatidium. So, what we have done now, we have actually taken advantage of simply duplicating a cell. Instead of one cell, evolution made a second cell. And then it allows this cell to make the very same stochastic choice. And then it can dramatically expand the color spectrum of discrimination of our butterflies. So this is nice. But now I'm going to give you another example, which is exactly the opposite. I'm going to give you an example where now nature does the opposite. It's going to sacrifice color vision to be able to improve motion detection. It's about in tablets, so horse flies. So horse flies, you know, that these nasty flies so next time you have one of the landing on you, she's going to be painful, she's going to cut your skin and inject some anticoagulant, make you bleed, and then suck up your blood. So, so okay. And uh, next time you see that, don't kill the flies, please. Look at her eyes, she has absolutely gorgeous eyes. <laughs> <laughs> she has gorgeous eyes. And those eyes, are, those stripes are very different from the dolly eyes I showed you before. Those eyes just look for display. <laughs> so, this is actually a female, and only female is going to, to cut you, and she wants basically to attract the males, and the male will oh my god, you have such beautiful eyes. <laughs> and the male will recognize her, but then she, is, she wants only the best male, and to get the best male, she wants the most fit male. So she's immediately going to take off, and start looping, and having this complicated flight pattern, to the male to try to catch her in flight into the male. So the male, what he needs to have, he doesn't care about good color vision, what he needs to be able is to get good motion detection to be able to capture the female fly. And he needs what he has, what we call love spot, <laughs> which means the anterior dorsal part of the male, which faces the sky, which feeds the place, so he always tracks the female from down below and from the back, which means part of the eyes they see the female as this improved motion detector with much larger omatidia, and you get to see uh, adapted uh, type of photoreceptor to be able to detect the female in flight to improve its motion. So it compresses the stripes here, it doesn't care about being beautiful, it just want to have this improved. Males are bags of sperms, when they give us a sperm, we don't care about that, okay? So, now this is one species, and again, another species that is the Indian red species, okay? Very nice, beautiful, and the males say, oh my god, how beautiful you are, I'm going to chase you, and you can see, he has this beautiful <laughs> love spot, this very efficient love spot to be able to detect it. This is the most dramatic example, like in, not in flies, like in mayflies, which are not flies. Mayflies is this really stupid stuff over here, <laughs> really ridiculous stuff, where basically they are like a telescope, a very <coughs> bright eye, everything focuses on light. And basically they are standing on the ground, and they see those female mayflies flying around, 
dark spot of a bright background, and this serves to be able to detect them, and then she can zoom in and be able to capture them. So again, in the extreme case of male uh, specification, sexual dimorphism, which is simply for increasing motion detection. Now, we don't want to work on horsefly because they're pretty nasty, and we notice actually that the same behavior that I described to you for horseflies exists in a fly that you have in your kitchen, the musca domesticus, the houseflies, the male, uh, fe the female, female flies, and the male try to catch her in flight, and they make in flight. I'm sure you have seen that. The uh, male or musca doesn't have a conspicuous uh, uh, love spot, but it does have a love spot. So it means the anterior dorsal part of the eye, if you look inside of the eye, is actually a very good system for improved motion detection. In the fruit flies, you have these eight photoreceptor cells. The one that ignores the six outer photoreceptors, which are indeed involved in motion detection. And then you have R7 and R8. And what happens in, only in the male, and only in the dorsal anterior part of the male, the R7 cell, the so one that got duplicated in butterflies, is going to be lost. It's going to be transformed into an outer photoreceptor. It's going to be in, in transformed into a motion detector to make seven instead of six. So what again, it moves to the periphery, and it expresses a broad spectrum of rhodopsin to be able to be able to detect the female with seven rather than six photoreceptor cells. And you can see the R8 cell is still in the middle at its place underneath, but the R7 cell now is moved at the periphery, and now you have seven photoreceptors involved in motion detection. But as you know, detecting light is not sufficient. You need to process information, you need to process motion. And in flies, motion and color vision are processed by two different optic lobe layers, the lamina from motion detection, the medulla for color discrimination. So the photoreceptor I just mentioned to you, which are involved in motion detection, the outer photoreceptor, the sixth outer photoreceptor, they project into the lamina, they project and they stop into the lamina, where motion detection will first be processed. So six photoreceptors stop here. The remaining two photoreceptors, the one involved in color discrimination, keep going, don't stop into the lamina, and they go to the medulla, with this beautiful retinotopic map, to be able to process color discrimination. Now, the question is what happened in the musca is, in fact, the musca R7 cell, I told you, get repurposed from color discrimination to motion detection. It expresses the broad spectrum of the team, and actually it gets rewired to the motion detection system. So now what you have, seven photoreceptors that project here, and only one that stays to the medulla, and everything by itself is useless, so basically the fly part of the eye is actually uh, uh, um, is, uh, blind, color blind. So the question is, how does this happen? How does the R7 cell change its projection pattern to project to the lamina rather than to project to the medulla? In fact, again, we can rely on our deep knowledge of the fruit fly's eye. And we know what happened. We know what is the six outer photoreceptors stop into the lamina. They do stop there because they express a gene called breakless. And again, same name, they call breakless because in the absence of the gene, the photoreceptor fail to break into the lamina and they keep going into the medulla. So in a breakless mutant, all six photoreceptors go deeper, they don't stop in the lamina. So basically, the reason why the photoreceptors stop here is because of breakless. Now, the reason why R7 and R8 don't stop in the medulla is because they express another gene called RAND, and when RAND does, it antagonizes breakless, and basically it allows those genes, those cells, to go deeper into the medulla, to not break. So what you have is that in a fruit fly eyes, so R7 and R8 express RAND, and the R1 to R6 don't express right. So we say, maybe this certain thing has happened in a low spot. So we look in the Musca uh, uh, retina, and what you have, right is in express in R7 and R8, R7 and R8, in the ventral part of the eye. But if you look in the low spot, which is here, you can see now, right is only expressed in the R itself. R7 no longer expressed right, and as a consequence, because you don't express right, you can stay into the lamina and join the other uh, photoreceptor, which are involved in the process. So what you have here is that uh, you have basically a few examples of how you can use our deep knowledge of the fruit fly eyes. We know so much about it, most likely one of the best developmental systems known in, in, in nature, and we can use this knowledge to understand how nature can evolve the system to be able to adapt to different uh, conditions. So I want to stop here and thank my peer with my Ivo Divogal. We got a lot of help from Keith Shop with our photographer and Kenta Arikawa in Japan who helped us a lot with the, with the butterflies. And again, these are the rest I could tell you about the people who do work on other parts of the club. We also do physiology and motion detection here. 
We still work on the retina to figure out how that happens. We also have some work on ants, yes. Um, <laughs> mostly on uh, Artenados, try to see how epigenetics controls it. And that people were just at the lab recently. And before I go, I just want to show you a few more in a random picture. So here's another tabanid, another horse flies. This one comes from Texas. You can recognize Texas, yes. <laughs> um, it's another random distribution, but it's much larger spots. I don't know what it means. This one tries to look like a bee. Okay? It's trying to hide as a bee. Um, this one also. Okay, this one, I don't know, it's just beautiful. Um, this one, I guess, is dorsal and eventually it's different. This one is a big head. Uh. <laughs> I think he's a big hunter. Actually, he's an interesting fly because he's actually a fly that hunt prey in flight. And actually, we do believe that this fly has a love spot throughout the whole eye, both men and female. It's a killer spot. So we try to figure out what And my, my favorite is this one here. Mitch has drawn this beautiful drawing on both the men and female. And how do you draw this kind of thing? I don't have no idea. And just to show you, going back to butterflies, I think butterflies can see color very well. So exactly from uh, Kentaro Rikawa, so it's a disc, it's a yellow disc, and you put sugar water on it, and the butterflies going to come up there, and it's going to love the sugar water, and it's going to do Yes. Okay. And so learn that the yellow and sugar uh, go together. Okay. And then what you do, you offer him the choice of a yellow, a red, a blue, and a green disc, and you will see it always goes to the yellow disc. And it could be that you remember the yellow disc was here, but not so, because what you can do is actually change the yellow disc and move it somewhere else, okay? And you can see it doesn't care, it's going to go to the yellow disc, whatever, okay? So they're very good color discrimination. And uh, I must say, unfortunately, the fruit flies don't do so well. So we try to do this kind of assay, but the fruit flies they don't do so well. So again, butterflies do rely extensively on color vision, and again, this test that you need Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have time for some questions. Yes. That was wonderful. Uh, but you didn't answer a question. Uh, does stochastic uh, distribution have any advantage over regular distribution? Both work. Why? Yeah. Choose one or the other. So again, um, the reason I ask the question because I always hope somebody in the crowd will tell me why the case. So, and frankly, I don't know. Um, it's definitely not something which is easy to handle. So in human, you remember the reason why human are stochastic is because they duplicated the gene and they forgot to duplicate the LCR. And as a consequence, you have two genes next to one another. Nature chose this one or this one. And so basically, it works. We keep it for eight, 20 million years. It's fine. Now, it's a lot of trouble because a red photoreceptor, one is red, you need to tell the brain, hey, I'm red, and the green needs to say, I'm green. And the difference between a green and a red photoreceptor is three amino acids. I mean, the two cells differ by three amino acids, which is the three amino acids that differ between the green and the red of And how do you tell the brain that you are green or red simply by three amino acids? It's pretty hard to imagine. So the model now is what we call fires together, wires together, which means if they get the green light, they're going to fire together and maybe tell the brain, okay, we are, so we don't know how this happens. So we believe that in, in new mind, it's a difficult question to process for the brain, but it managed to do that. In fact, the Jay and Maureen Nis took some new world monkeys, which are color blind, or the dichromat, and she put the human system, they put the human system into the uh, new world monkey, and the new world monkey acquired the ability to see in trichromacy. So the brain was not designed to see in pre-color, still managed to adapt to be able to see in pre-color. Yeah. So in your mind, it seemed to work, we keep it. Only 8 million, 20 million years is fine. Fruit flies, definitely much, much more uh, concerned, 250 million years. And I have no idea why it shows it. My only possibility is that this allows a fairly quick adaptation of the pattern. You can change the ratio fairly well, easily, by simply you know, tuning a bit the stochastic choice which will be much more difficult to... If you want to make a 1 to 3 ratio with deterministic choice, it's going to be very hard. Here it's very easy. So if you want to change the ratio, you might be able to do that. So that stability would be over a very, very long time scale, yeah. on an evolutionary scale yeah. rather than... The problem is, yeah, not at the, at the individual level. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we, we don't have that much. I mean, in all the protophila, they're all 30-70. Muscar, those 30-70. Butterflies only 50-50. Um, 
And again, we have some variation, but not a huge amount of variation. So it might be a good explanation, but I don't think it's true. Anyway, so it was a long answer. Yes? Uh, you, you say it's stochastic, but how stochastic it is? Like how, what does that mean? Because for instance, you showed that the human retina, and we're clearly seeing like clusters of... Uh, of uh, yes. So uh, is it... Uh, Okay, in a human retina, I don't really know. In a fly retina, we did near neighbor analysis, which means you, you know, okay. and absolutely stuck at There's okay. no bias whatsoever. So, I mean, you don't influence the choice of the neighbor. Yeah. And actually, what I should say also is that the neighbors are not neighbor. In fact, there is 10 cells between the two cells that make stochastic choice. Mm -hmm. So you only see the red and the green or yeah. blue, but there are quite a number of cells in between. So they don't, they will not have any way to communicate okay. with one another. Okay. So we do believe, and actually from all the molecular work we have done, okay. in terms of how the choice happened, we know that, in fact, not only each cell chooses stochastically, in fact, each allele of a gene in the cell makes a stochastic choice. So this we know for sure. In human, I understand, I, I, I don't, I mean, I agree with you, there is some cluster in human, but you maybe have something to do with X inactivation or something like that, it would be earlier specification. Usually it's a physicist, another physicist who has a question, he's a biologist. Oh, right. I see some stripes. <laughs> <laughs> yes? You mentioned that um, in sensorless, there's a chromatin structure that modulates expression of spinous. Spinous. Yes, sinus and spinous. This is uh, uh, So, sorry, was it in the, in the butterfly then? Was it also spinous? Or? Yeah, spinous. Yeah. So, is it the same regulation structure? Is it the same chromatin? We, no, so, we, I mean, we, we know spinous exists. We have not manipulated spinous. So, what we want to do is take spinous from butterfly, which is at 50 50, and move it to foot fly, which is 30 70, to see whether we get some chance. So we actually now, again, I could tell you some molecular approach for doing that. So we have very nice technology to see, to modulate the frequency. So part of the lab, which is much more mechanistic, is trying to figure out how do you get this ratio? And why do you vary this ratio from one species to one another? We do believe that so the reason why spine is expressed in a stochastic manner, in fact, it has an element that wants to be expressed in all of the other cells. <coughs> so if you just, as this element is you know, and then you have two repressor elements that force together that extinguish it in 30% of the cell and cell. And depending on the distance of these two repressor elements, you might set up the frequency. So it will be fairly easy to evolve the system to be able to, be able to modulate it. Yes? Is there a temporal scale from R7 to R8 that may dictate to which one has uh, spineless expression? So spineless is downstream of, of a, of a uh, um, Prospero, which marks the R7 set. So something specifies R7 as being R7, then spinous can be turned on. It can only be turned on into the R7. As I answered to him, you know, I told you that spinous want to be expressed in all R7 cells. So it responds to Prospero to be expressed in all R7 cells, then something turns it off. So you can only express spinous in the R7 cells. Now you can trick the system by forcing spinous expression into other cells by genetic means. In this case, you transform them into spinous and make a stochastic choice. So in flight, you can create a situation when you have more than one cell that express spinous in a stochastic manner. But then it becomes a mess. Yes? So you mentioned that the species that have changed one of their photoreceptors from detecting for color vision for motion that they'll be able to better detect motion. but. How does having an extra one help you detect motion better? Okay, so, okay. so, so there are two problems there. First, how do you have seven photoreceptors and six cells? Actually, the, one of the major limitations of the fly eye is actually quantum detection. Each, each unit, each pixel has one, its own lens. You have one lens for the whole eye. Your aperture of your lens is huge as compared to the... So they lose a lot of, of light because they have this tiny lens to collect light. So adding one six more, Photoreceptor is improving the, 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 the not so much the resolution but the quantum detection. Now the question we can ask is what the point if all the males have seven photoreceptors, what's the advantage of seven photoreceptor? So I don't know. I mean maybe at some point means the males are all so good they can catch all the females. I don't think it's true. So <laughs> because you need to see the female to be. So the female must evolve in parallel to be even better fly to be able to escape those males with seven photoreceptors than six. <laughs> adaptive in nature, what difference would it make whether the different um, photoreceptors are arranged in stripes versus 
that kind of stochastic pattern. I mean, you can tune either way, presumably by getting the right mix. So yeah. why, why one versus the other? Okay. My, uh, maybe it wasn't very clear the first time I talked about it. I think the reason why you have an arrangement in stripes in the dolly, the one which has a deterministic choice, is not for color vision. I think it's actually for polarized light vision. Okay. And I don't understand why. But again, so what you seem to have, you have a stripe of filters that basically increase the, 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 the contrast by the two photoreceptors with the same type of polarization, and then the next one is actually going to measure vector polarization, mm -hmm. like that and like that. Why is it like that or not? I mean, you might, you might know about the mantis shrimp. The mantis shrimp is an amazing animal. It's a little animal, the one that you cannot keep in your aquarium because it's so strong, it can break the aquarium. It bangs on the aquarium, make cavitation, breaks the aquarium. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the mantis shrimp has its eyes, the eyes, with the, they can move, okay? And if you look at the eyes, there are six stripes. Six stripes, and those stripes are basically different types of color discrimination. Two of them are clear polarized light. And so it might be that you do the same thing. You have those stripes that move here, in the, and so what the mantis ship does, it, it sees a female and the female says, hey, look at me. And the male opens there and says, okay, oh, you are here, I'm going to go for you. So um, it's possible that having those stripes is helping you scan the wall in a good way. And the fly doesn't move its eye, but again, it's always, the fly basically flies on the ground, it's useless. I mean, you, it doesn't see. It only sees when it moves. So when it moves, you can have a stripe and be able to uh, basically see at each moment with one stripe, the other one stripe. Okay, so uh, I'm going to ask one question, but before, please join us for the reception, the wine and cheese afterwards. Uh, so you can ask Claude. Uh, it's French one. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. um, so Claude, my question is just uh, you, you, you've shown this nice video with the red, the blue, the yellow, and, but you didn't tell us what you would predict. I mean, I assume that your dream experiment would be, of course, you take your flies that you've knocked out spineless, but that now you want to, the butterflies, and then test them with this okay. thing. So what do you think? So, so exactly. So what you want to do is to see whether if you make only one subtype in the spinous mutant, you should lose a lot of the color discrimination. Now, there is a little problem. As I told you, the spinous gene is a list of genes, which means if you knock out spinous in a hole anymore, the animal is dead. And therefore, the only way you can do this, you can do the experiment I showed you, is because you have a mixture, a camera, where part of the eye is, is white, part of the animal is wild type, most of the animal is wild type, and then there's this patch of tissue which are mutant, which is sufficient for survival. And if you want to do behavior experiment, you need the whole eye to be mutant. So we need to be uh, to make the whole eye mutant. But if the whole eye is mutant, the rest of the eye is dead, or the part of it is dead. So we need to add what we call what we have the technology we have in flies to basically to only make the mutation in the eye. And in flies, we know how to do that. Now with CRISPR Cas9, we should be able to do that soon. So it's the next step to make basically a conditional mutant. You have a mutant which is active unless you remove it, and you only remove it in the eye. So we are going to do that, but it will take some time. Uh, breaking a gene is easy, inserting something there is not so easy. It's very difficult. And I assume there's some kind of co-evolution between the actual colors of the butterfly and the perception to... There must be a really yeah. interesting... Yeah, so again, the question is that they have beautiful color vision, and they also have this beautiful uh, uh, pigmentation on the wings. And of course, most of the people who can butterflies work on wing patterns, and they know a lot of genes which affect the... the I mean, maybe you might have heard about the double sex gene in butterflies. It's a species of butterflies where, so the males are, they only carry sperm, you know, and they're light. They can escape the bird. The females are heavy, they're full of eggs, they cannot escape the bird. So what they need to do to escape the bird, they dress as toxic butterflies. They mimic the toxic butterflies. The problem with toxic butterflies are only toxic because they eat one plant, which is toxic, and they need to detoxification. And the plant is very restricted, which means there are very few of them. Now, the birds, don't attack the toxic butterfly because they know that uh, they taste bad. But now if you have a lot of mimics which don't taste bad, <laughs> the bird will never learn. So you can have too many of the mimics, otherwise they will kill the purple. So what this butterfly does is actually mimics not one species, but two or three species of toxic butterfly to spread the load. <laughs> so one, the males are all the same, and the females are three types that mimic three different types of toxic butterflies. And so what were they? <laughs> I'll tell you, it's the one thing I'm saying to break, I promise to break, but I just, I couldn't help noticing that the gene fault is involved in actually making some of the colors on the wing, yeah, yeah. but it's also involved in patterning some of the butterflies, and you wonder whether there's some kind of conflict between 
using the same gene to detect it and actually make the color? No, it's not the conflict. I think it's the opposite. I mean, I think to some extent you want the same gene that makes a beautiful color to be able to help the other sex to recognize it. So it would be great if the same polymorphism would actually make, increase the pattern of the wing and then at the same time adjust the color vision of the system to be able to adapt it better. I don't believe it's going to be the case, but I think uh, uh, it's possibility. Okay, let's give uh, for a